which the priority of Olympus was under siege by thinkers like Friedrich Kreutzer, who saw Greek thought as derived ultimately from India. Schelling, friend of Kreutzer, the great admirer of Kreutzer, was also an expert linguist and was particularly fond of Hebrew, whose priority he defended against Sanskrit, the, uh, the priority of his friend Kreutzer. In the year that Schelling moved to Munich, 1806, Napoleon granted the elevation of Bavaria from a dukedom to a kingdom. Maximilian I, Joseph, and his Francophile Prime Minister, uh, Count Montgillat, created new and important institutions in the city. The, the university was moved from Landshut, the Archdiocese of Freising and Munich was formed, and a new parliament was created. Serfdom in Bavaria was abolished in 1808, and the kingdom acquired its first written constitution. Now Schelling, in this turbulent period, uh, became a key figure in this pivotal period of German history in which Bavaria attempted to rival Austria to the east and Prussia to the north. Lacking the military or economic resources to rival these bigger neighbors, culture became the key part of the self-assertion of the new kingdom. And Schelling became the first General Secretary of the Academy of Bildenden und Kunste, so the General Secretary of the Academy of the Fine Arts, founded in 1808. So in this period where Schelling is playing a key administrative role, uh, helping to structure the new kingdom of Bavaria, uh, he has two very important colleagues. Um, uh, F.H. Jacobi, 1743 to 1819, and Franz von Bader, 1765 to 1841. These two figures reignited his interest in the mystical sources of his pietist childhood, particularly Burma. And in this period, Schelling's speculative philosophy takes a distinctive term, turn. For Schelling, as for Hegel, the finite mind is properly a mirror or speculum of the infinite. So speculative philosophy, a very key concept of this period for Hegel as well as for Schelling, is the attempt to grasp the world as, and this is Schelling's terminology, as the Gegenbild or the counter image or reflection of the divine. And it's in this context that the wisdom tradition becomes particularly important. Uh, this notion of the, um, the uh, spiritual being, but the semi personal character. Um, and here something like the tradition of the spiritual wedding uh, derived from Solomon's wisdom, uh, where, which allows Origen to interpret the Song of Songs allegorically as Christ's wedding with his church. Where it's, uh, we can read in Wisdom 724 to 27, to 27 that wisdom is more active than all active things, reaches everywhere by reason of her purity, for she is the breath of the power of God, a pure emanation of the glory of Almighty God, and therefore no defiled thing cometh into her, for she is the brightness of eternal light, and the unspotted mirror of God's majesty and the image of his goodness. Now these verses contain these important metaphors of breath and wisdom. Uh, as God's mirror, wisdom is his splendid periphery, making up his appearance and revelation. So here we can see mirror as the leading metaphor of speculation. But what is being speculated? Well, it's the unfathomable glory of God which becomes visible in the mirror image. Now this uh, corresponds to the philosophical tradition where Plato's Alcibiades, which was the introductory text in the Platonic school, uh, we read that the observing eye uh, discussing the Delphic uh, 
oracles know thyself, sees itself in a mirror and conceives this mirror as an image of the soul. And if the soul, dear Alcibiades, is ever to know herself, must she not look at the soul, especially at that part of the soul where her virtue reside, resides, which is wisdom, mm -hmm. and at any other which is like this. And obviously for Socrates, this wisdom is divine insight and divine knowledge. Then this is that part of the soul which resembles God, and he who looks at this and at the whole class of things divine, at God and at wisdom, will most likely know himself. Now, in the midst of, in, 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 of this theological shift in Schelling's thought, he publishes in 1809 a text that formed a decisive moment in his development on human freedom, a text where the influence of Burma becomes particularly evident. And here the idea of the self-differentiation in God is developed. He presents God as a complex unity, both as ground and his actualized being. This model of the eternal becoming of God, the form of self-constitution, is then developed in various drafts known as the ages of the world, the Weltalter. Uh, interestingly, this is a title also used by the Swabian pietist Oettinger. So Schelling's own, as it were, intellectual inheritance is uh, evident in the title. There were three main versions of this work, which was never published in his lifetime. So 1811, 1813, 1814 to 15. The manuscripts were never published and were destroyed in the bombing raids in the Second World War. Uh, but they were, so what we have from those texts is a copy of them by a scholar called um, Schroeter. And this is a very uh, dense uh, work. And I'm just going to give you a uh, passage from it where he's talking about the uh, process of the, of the theogony. Mm -hmm. Here one is to think neither of a struggle between subject or object nor of a conflict of forces within objective being, sign. It is much rather as if, in graceful interplay, such tensions dissolve themselves in the joy of mutually discovering one another and being discovered. Lucid purity experiences its first and purest reality with a bliss all its own. But it is now the force of contraction that rejoices in the softening of its severity and harshness that assuaged, the German is das Gestilte, which has the sense of a, a mother uh, feeding a child um, at the breast, that assuaged hunger of its awakening desires. It is not a necessary bond that binds together the two forces in objective being, but instead a bond that freely renews itself moment to moment. The playful activity of the principle of contradiction Porting with itself. I think you could also translate that as sporting with itself. The free movement of the two primordial forces does not come at all to an end. Instead, the playful forces freely strive in every moment to break free, while in every moment they gently come back together, producing in the existent the purest joy of a quiet tranquility within which the miracle of its own nature, Wesen, is revealed. Now, uh, that's a characteristically dense bit of Teutonic uh, philosophical theology for you, but all I want to point out from this passage is this stress upon the element of play, uh, which is coming from the, the wisdom tradition. Of course, Schelling might be accused of intellectualism here, of Gnosticism, of overactive imagination, even perhaps creating a fourth hypostasis um, or infusing masculine and feminine elements into the uh, members of the Trinity. All those criticisms that you find later in the Russian sociological tradition um, that is so dependent upon Schelling. Uh, but one should, of course, remember that Sophia is very s significant for the Alexandrian tradition, especially Philo of Alexandria, the idea of wisdom as Yahweh's daughter, the idea of the ideas, mother of the Logos. 
There's also another aspect here which is significant, that of German Romanticism itself, and a particular interest in the polarity of male and female. Think of Goethe, alles Vergänglicher ist nur ein Gleichnis, das Unvergängliche hier wird's Ereignis, das Unbeschreibliche hier ist es getan, das Ewig Weibliche zieht uns hernan. So, that which passes is only an image, the unchangeable here is event, the indescribable here it is done, the eternal feminine leads us up. So those uh, celebrated words from Goethe's Faust uh, were part of a world in which uh, Novalis, Franz von Bader, Josef Goeres, other figures of the Romantics were fascinated by this principle of male and female polarity in nature and mythology. There's also another element here. Schelling has broken up with Hegel. So of course, they were sharing a dorm together in the Tübingen Stift. And Schelling was the younger one, the brighter one. Hegel was like the older, slightly duller, um, but uh, stable character. And then Schelling finds in 1807 with Hegel's phenomenology of, phenomenology of spirit that his older comrade from Tübingen, who was always behind him, is now the great star of German philosophy. And, and Schelling reacts strongly to, uh, to Hegel's preeminence. And to some extent, one could see the obscurity of Schelling's philosophy as linked to a desire to or a recoil for what he regards as the sterile conceptual rationalism of Hegel. The task of philosophy for Schelling in this period, up to his death, one could say, becomes that of narration. The philosopher's vocation is, and I'm using the language of uh, Henri Corbin, as he was directly influenced by Schelling in this, is that of a visionary recital of reality. So the philosopher is there to give a protocol of being that which is so here philosophy is conceived of as that which is always relying upon the unprethinkable lord of being now turning from this unprethinkable lord of being hair designs uh, what we have here is a neoplatonic theogony now i'm not using the term neoplatonic in the strict sense so Please don't come back to me and say, well, you know, Plotinus isn't going to say this, or Proclus, or Damascus, or whatever. I'm using the word here rather loosely, but nevertheless, I think uh, there's a meaningful sense of it to refer to the speculative legacy emerging out of late antique and Christian thought. So when, for example, the remarkable uh, Neoplatonic Irishman in the court of Charles the Bald, John Scott Eriogena, 1815 to eight, sorry, 815, sorry, a thousand years out, 815 to 877 conceives of divine self-recognition and even creation in nature as linked to modes of divine unfolding. So creation is also for the divine creare, so it's to be created. So not only here is creation ex deo, rather than ex nihilo, but there's a dynamic process of the unfolding within the divine. Meister Eckhart, 1260 to 1328, we had the notion that the Godhead contains the potentiality of the triune God. The triune God is the unfolding of the Godhead. There is also a necessity, a naught, that drives the begetting of the Son. Now, the interpretation of Eckhart provides many difficulties for the student of his thought, but it's easy to see how a figure like Jakob Burma, with his doctrine of God as the urground or the primordial ground, as Burma says, stille ohne Wesen, or tranquility or quiet without, um, without substance, this is all very difficult to translate, is an inheritor of that speculative mysticism of Eckhart. 
And indeed, within the speculative theogony of Burma, there's an antithetical principle within God that compels the divine expansion as the Trinity and leads to the creation of the material world. And in Burma, we find the world soul of uh, Neoplatonism, Christian Jewish doctrine of wisdom, the epistemology of the medieval mystical tradition, and the veneration of the especially lovely, heavenly, pure maiden and goddess of the spirit, whom he identifies quite explicitly with the Virgin Mary. This is quite extraordinary that this uh, Lutheran figure should have such a strong emphasis upon the Virgin. Um, and in, in fact, th this is apparently characteristic of Silesia in this period. Now, um, Schelling is drawing on this emphasis that we find in Burma upon the uh, wisdom figure when in a passage like this, this playful zest, die spielende Lust, I mean, the Lust is in the German is even stronger than zest, I'd say, in the emerging life of God was recognized by the ancients who expressively called it wisdom, an unspotted mirror of divine vitality. And because of the passively suffering qualities that emergent being has taken upon itself in being an image of its good heartedness. The Lord had me by his side from the beginning of his path before he made a thing. I was already there. I was already from eternity before the earth, before the mountains had settled in and the fountains flowed with water. I was the master worker, the Werkmeister, by his side. Every day brought pleasure to me, hatte meine Lust, and I always played happily before him. So here Schelling's discussing this idea of wisdom emerging from the inner Trinitarian love as the first progression of revelation emerging from the inner divine life. So in this sense, uh, wisdom is parallel to Christology and even bears some Christological functions. The world is primarily grounded in wisdom and is created through it. Um, there's also the proximity here to the world soul, particularly Plato's doctrine of the world soul is laid out in the uh, Timaeus. But the, in the biblical wisdom, the uh, fulfilling power of the cosmos is described as God's breath. In this divine breath, wisdom reaches from end to end mightily and ordereth all things sweetly. So Schelling thinks of Sophia as the communication of God's overflowing power, that which emerges without the divine trinity. And in Sophia, God is a mirror to himself. As I've suggested, he discusses divine wisdom in relation to these quotations from the Book of Wisdom and, the, uh, and Proverbs. This primordial world is not static, it contains the dynamic of self-realization. The mirror, Sophia, reflects the force of essence and becoming, so that nothing remains and is fixed, but is in a process of permanent formation. So Sophia is also significant for Schelling in terms of his concept of matter. Uh, he presents Sophia as the passive potency of matter, uh, essential in the transition of spirit into extension or space. So thus, Sophia is um, not within the tr Trinitarian God, who rejoices and defines himself in his pulsing life of expansion and contraction, but rather, an, he says, an already softened essence of light. Um, this mirror is thus a mirror, this wisdom is a mirroring, so to some extent, a negation of the deity. And it's in this negation that what he calls the most subtle corporeality emerges. Now, um, some of the most interesting passages on Sophia are found in a 
uh, a Nachschrift or a lecture notes from Schelling's 1830 lectures in Munich entitled Introduction into Philosophy, Einleitung in the Philosophie, which is uh, edited by Walter Erhardt and published in 18, 1989. And in chapters 31 and 34, Sophia is described as the Prius of creation and also as blind will insofar as become verstand. Uh, here he's linking Sophia explicitly to the doctrine of creation and to what uh, he calls positive philosophy. So philosophy that is explicitly linked to uh, revelation. Now, as we've seen, uh, the wisdom is tied to a conception of the world soul or the catena between the supreme and the lowest in order to inhabit in men. As catena or the bond of things among each other, wisdom is present on every level of creation. And Schelling says it ascends and descends the musical scale of entities. Since wisdom is present in every part of life and nature, we can also claim that life, nature, world, the objective course of things in one word, being itself, is wise. So according to Schelling, we can only be wise because the object are grounded in the divine wisdom. Thus wisdom ceases to be only a human virtue it resides rather in the world participating in God's wisdom. In fact, uh, Schelling argues that the etymology of the word Sophia comes from roots meaning whole and harmed and damaged. Therefore, he says, true philosophy deals with the whole and despires to restore consciousness to its wholeness and integrity. Sophia is an image and symbol of love. And if love is that which binds, then wisdom is this principle of connection and of unity. So um, if we could just turn to the handout where we can see um, uh, from a late lecture, so uh, Schelling's lectures that he gave uh, to, um, in Berlin. Dominic? Hello? Dominic? H how long have I got? Thank you, but I'm trying to unmute myself. Uh, you've got, well, let's say if we break in 11.15, I mean, I don't know, about another 18, 20 minutes? Okay, okay, fine, right, okay, that that's fine. Good. Okay, um, that's great. So, now, the passage that I'm, uh, I'm going to go through, this will be the passage that you've got um, in front of you. So as far back as human law reaches. Um, so this is from uh, Schelling's lectures that he was giving in Berlin. So Hegel dies in 1831, in fact he, uh, dies of the plague that mm -hmm. happens. Uh, but Schelling is then called to Berlin to attack the Drachensat or the dragon seed of pantheism. So he's called up by the, uh, the, the Prussian king to the chair of Hegel to attack the pantheistic legacy of Hegel's thought. And this is very significant for the history of thought because many of the students sitting in Schelling's lectures were Russians. And it's through this, or via this period in particular, that Schelling's influence on Russian thought is established. So um, when we come to figures like uh, Solovyov or Bulgakov, it's through this uh, sociological aspect of Schelling and particularly in the Berlin phase. Even, as I was mentioning to Dominic last night, if you look at, at a figure like Pasternak, his early studies were on 
Schelling and this uh, sociological tradition. So a figure like Lara and Dr. Shivago is, is actually linked to the, uh, the idea of wisdom. Okay, so let's uh, look at the passage from this. It's, it's, it's quite a recent translation, but it's, it hasn't been uh, published yet. So as far back as human law reaches, that originary potence, urpotence, has been celebrated as the origins, origin of all the kinds of being different from God. So here the point is that Schelling is presenting a philosophical monotheism, and he <clears throat> is presenting the divine as a uh, unity and difference. So he thinks monotheism only makes sense where one also has a conception of the potentiality for difference within the divine. Now it was worshipped in Preneste as the Fortuna Primigenia, in whose arms the future lord of the world lay. Fortuna is that which does and does not have the ability to be, das sein und nicht sein kennende, the originary accidental, das ursufällige, which can only be subsequent to that which is necessary, not prior to it, which does not really belong to divine nature and yet cannot be separated from it. So this was the point I was making about this odd status of the Sophia in Schelling's philosophical theology in relation to the uh, speculative doctrine of the Trinity that he presents. So uh, Sophia is rather um, a representation of God and retains only the nature of something that is adscititious, etwas angenommen, so something that comes to it. Fortuna was celebrated as the wet nurse of the world, Welt Anne, uh, Marta, Mother, and Materia, uh, matter, are factually related. I mean, that's a joke that a number of wits make that uh, materialists are um, often um, uh, mother worshippers. I mean, it's a kind of uh, materialism is grounded in a kind of um, uh, uh, mother goddess worship. So matter and, uh, and materia are factually related for Fortuna is the hypokemenon, the underlying substance of the future creation. She is the Maya, related to power, possibility, potence, Macht, Möglichkeit, uh, potence. So Maya here is again referring to the interest in Indian thought and uh, particularly Schlegel's great work, Die Weisheit der Inder. Uh, and with this interest in India, there was a development in uh, concern with the Sanskrit notion of Leela or divine play. So there's a reference to this here. So she is the Maya related to power, possibility, potence, which spread the web of mere semblance before the creator in order to trap him and impel him towards the actual creation. This potence is most pointedly expressed in the Proverbs of Solomon as wisdom or the Chokhmah. Jehovah, the name of the one who is the Lord of being. This is a key term for Schelling, the hair designs, uh, where he's stressing the unprethinkable uh, nature of the divine being. So this is a critique of Hegel's theological rationalism. Um, so the one who is the Lord of being possessed me at the beginning, but what should this potence, this wisdom, which sees God only as potence of blind being be called? This principle is not regarded here in its being outside of itself, also see signs, but in its possibility before its actual being. 
Here it is, however, subject, prios, the presupposition of all future movement, that which imparts its knowledge of the future movement to the creation. Here, where everything else is gained, not through necessity, but through free will, nothing should be considered completed until that which is last has been added. So here we have um, Schelling uh, discussing this principle of wisdom as this uh, prius, uh, which is leading to the whole creative process. Um, now, what I shall do is um, I want to just take you further down where you can see that the reference to Burma. Um, so in that originary potence is contained the understanding of divine life, understanding, forestanding, originally standing, uh, Verstand, Vorstand, Urstand, then Jakob Burma, which signifies that from which something comes forth. That originary potence, however, is actually the originary standing Urstand that ties it in with the whole process. And if this potence is then brought back from its movement into a state of rest, then it is the actual understanding, the actual subject, the substanding, understand it, quod substat, that which stands under the explicated divine existence. For the being that God gives himself by adopting the opposite being is an explicated being and the actualizing originary potence posited as such that it no longer relates this being as understanding or originally standing, but as substanding. Which he then um, continues um, that all that was cited previously from the Proverbs about wisdom is consistent with the nature of this originary potence as posited by us, uh, which first imparts the creation to the creator. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of this way. I, he moved out of the unforethinkable being before his deeds. This line, Schelling says, demonstrates that it is about something that is not an act of God. That originary potence is not brought forth by God while it is not before him as potence of being. It is there as he is. It presents itself to him as something he can neither desire nor not desire. Although not God, it is also not his creature and it is therefore between God and the creatures. I mean, here, of course, Schelling is drawing on this basic ambiguity in the tradition about where does wisdom stand in relation to the inner life of the Godhead and the created order. The Lord possessed it. He overcame it because he had not seen it there before, but afterhand, after he is, after he established himself. He had it as a possibility not of himself, but of all else. And he goes on to note that Varro, in his grammatical reflections on mythology, called the heavens and the earth the gods that found it all, but he distinguishes the principes deos, the first gods, uh, those who have dominion over the first things, from those who have dominion over the highest things. In this sense, wisdom is from eternity posited by the creator as that which originates all who ties it to the process of becoming. I was established where there were no watery depths when he laid his compass on the earth during the origins of the worldly system. But even after it was completed, I remained at his side as a ch child, as a nursling, flickling, uh, not as craftsman. Also, also as an adopted child. Plato speaks as one that was brought up, mit aufgezogen, together with the divine nature wherein there was much disorder at the beginning. The potence was not yet set out. In Ausgesetz, thus it was like a child in his father's house. This originary possibility continues, was welcomed by the creator. I was the model for creation. It showed him what was possible if he wanted to create. I showed it him day after day, i.e. all the moments of the future creation. And then he says, the Brahmins used to put to the missionaries on the spot with the following question, what did God do? 
before the creation, if the missionaries had picked up their Bibles more diligently, they would have found the answer in this passage. So here we can see in this extraordinary passage, uh, Schelling's struggling with the idea of wisdom as part of a speculative theology. So Schelling is using this idea that he's quite clearly taken from Burma as part of a project which was ultimately deemed unsuccessful by his contemporaries. Um, Kierkegaard, who attended these lectures, uh, remarked uh, rather bitterly that uh, he was too old to attend lectures and Schelling was too old to give them. Um, so these lectures were not a immediate success. But when we think of the uh, legacy of this period of Schelling's uh, uh, thought on the Russian tradition, then we can see Schelling as very much part of a tradition of philosophical thought about the idea of wisdom and bringing in a dimension of cosmic play to Christian thought. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Douglas. Uh, wonderful tour de force. And it's again, it's the connections. If I can just, maybe as a token of appreciation, show people something. This is the icon of holy wisdom of Novgorod. Sorry, I'll just show it to you again. Everybody can see that. And it, that is an artistic working out, if you like, of the influence of Schelling and others on Russian thought. I mean, I, I love the idea there of interplay as well. In the Middle Ages at Easter in the French cathedrals, the clergy were obliged to dance with a ball on the labyrinth of the cathedral because Gregory of Nyssa, of course, understood the, the great mystery of the resurrection was Christ restoring fallen humanity to the heavenly dance. But of course, some of the clergy tried to get out of it because they thought it was absurd. Maybe if they played a bit more, they would have understood a bit more. And thank God that maybe we have that freedom now. Um, thank you very much for such riches. And yes, sorry, there was just one little point. Where was it? But, um, I'm very interested, I must say, how Schelling was called in because so often with this sort of thing people say Christians good Christians say look this is lovely but it's all terribly pantheistic but what I find very valuable as a Christian is that Schelling was called in to work against pantheism I mean there is clearly a sense of God being in everything everything we found find lovely but in fact he's keeping them distinct and with this spirit of wisdom, uh, as created wisdom, as some sociologists say, in the middle. So that's very rich and I think very liberating for many of us who, who work as theologians, work in this area. So again, thank you so much. Now, um, I'm going to unpin you now, so to speak, um, so that everybody is in the window and there's a bit of time for questions. Um, right, something has gone blank. Um, uh, ah, yes, thank you. So, if you would like to ask a question, could you? Does everybody have a a wave or a kind of a hand thing? Uh, if you could just send that to me, Mbit Zoom, as the host, then. Um, and, and unmute yourself and then just just please just ask your um then i i will take a cue basically of questions thank you just to say john nick for those that don't know to locate that raise hand if you go to the participants 
So you'll have a mute button, the start video or whatever. Then the next one along is participants. If you click that, it will open it up. Okay. And then on the bottom left hand corner, you have a raise hand icon. Thanks, Ferdia. Thanks very and then, much. Yeah, then that will queue them up. Thank you. Oh, Alex. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah, can I hear you? Okay, this is the question for, for Douglas. Um, in your lecture ab uh, about shelling, there is lots of words like becoming uh, and creation in potentiality. Could you tell me if you know anything about possible link between 20th century pro 